Hello everybody and welcome to this video and we are carrying on our series on Much Ado About Nothing. The ebook is available at mrbruff.com and amazon.co.uk. Just follow the links in the description. For just £3.99 you get the complete original text, a line-by-line -line translation into modern English and detailed analysis of every scene. Written by Edna Hobbs, an expert on this play, it really is worth picking up. So in the last video we looked at a translation of Act 1, Scene 1, the hilarious uh, back and forth banter between Beatrice and Benedict being uh, the highlight of the scene. And we're going to analyse that scene in this video. To begin with, and we'll do this in each analysis video, let's have a summary of what's actually happened. So there's a messenger who brings Leonardo news that Don Pedro and his uh, soldiers are coming to stay with him. And he reports that one of the noblemen, Count Claudio, has stood out as a brave soldier. Beatrice then questions the messenger about Benedict, all the while insulting him, so that Leonardo explains that there is a merry war between them. And then the men arrive, and Don Pedro praises Leonardo for his hospitality, and he notices Hero and asks whether she is Leonardo's daughter. Benedict uses the opportunity to joke about her legitimacy, using double meanings, and Beatrice sneers that no one's listening to Benedict, which leads to their merry war of words. They trade insults for a while, and then Benedict says he's had enough and he walks away, which leaves Beatrice fuming that he's had the last word as usual. And then Don Pedro and Leonardo go inside with everybody else, but Claudio asks Benedict what he thinks of Hero, and it becomes clear that Claudio wants to marry uh, Hero, and... Um, you know, this disgusts Benedict, who says, no, I'm a, I'm a devout bachelor, I'll never get married. <clears throat> so then we um, get Don Pedro coming back. He wants to know what's keeping uh, Benedict and Claudio. And Don Pedro predicts that he will see Benedict fall in love one day. And uh, Benedict is, uh, you know, says, never, never me. So it sets the scene quite nicely for the events that are about to happen throughout the play. First off, the title, Much Ado About Nothing, is a bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? But what it really means is a lot of fuss about something insignificant. So as we study the play, we can be on the lookout for things that seem to be important, but turn out to be no big deal. And we'll, we'll go through them as we progress through the video series. There are other interpretations of the title, though. Nothing and noting were apparently homophones in Shakespeare's day, and noting used to be chiefly uh, about gossiping and overhearing things and spreading rumours. So we can think about the fact that in the play, quite a lot of the time there are letters and notes and notices and taking notes and spying, eavesdropping, the police officers, all of this kind of... Um, you know, noting is uh, in, in the foreground of the play. And musical notation is also referred to in Balthazar's speech. Note this before my notes, there's not a note of mine that's worth the noting, as well as the songs and references to music. So there are two possible interpretations of the title. It's important to establish right away the genre. This is a comedy, a romantic comedy, and in scene one we see two types of love. We have Claudio, who is everything that an Elizabethan nobleman was meant to be. Honourable, a brave soldier, someone who made his family proud. In fact, his uncle was so delighted by the good reputation Claudio earned that he burst into tears at the news of his valour. Hero is his female counterpart, a wealthy heiress, beautiful and meek. She's hardly said a word so far, just one sentence. And throughout the play, she hardly speaks at all. And if you compare her to Beatrice, the amount of dialogue is very minimal. She has the fewest lines of the four main characters and what she doesn't say is almost more not noteworthy than what she does say. She seems to have no opinions, she's never critical, she's never angry, she's more of an ideal than a real person. So on the one hand we've got Hero and Claudio and both ends and names end in O which is suggests they're not quite so great after all. Um, they're supposedly the ideal couple of this fairy tale love, but it's clear that Shakespeare is presenting them in many ways, and we'll see throughout the play, as uh, not the perfect presentation of what love should be. And then we've got Benedict and Beatrice, both names again beginning with a plosive 
B sound, a B sound. And um, you see that Hero and Claudio both end in the O, which is quite a weak sound. Beatrice and Benedict both begin with a B, which is quite a strong sound. And they're far from ideal. They're both too opinionated, they're argumentative, they're determined not to be hurt by love, and Beatrice particularly refuses to conform to the role of the obedient companion, which is uh, how women were supposed to behave in that patriarchal society in Elizabethan England. And yet you've got to ask yourself, you know, throughout the play, what is Shakespeare suggesting? And, and it's very, uh, very clear that he loves Beatrice and Benedict and everything they stand for. A little look at the context then. Shakespeare himself was one of those people like Beatrice and Benedict who didn't conform to the norms of his time when it came to love. Uh, marriage was like a business transaction. We see Claudio asking whether Leonardo has a son to check who will get the money. And Shakespeare should have consulted his father and then together they would have gone to uh, his younger bride's family a bit like Don Pedro's going to do for Claudio but what actually happened was he fell in love with a 26 year old when he was only 18 Anne Hathaway and I know that's not his real wife on the screen but that's the actress who clearly takes her name from uh, Shakespeare's wife so Anne Hathaway was an independent woman she lived with her brother she owned her own land and if you think about it, Shakespeare wasn't famous at the time, being just 18, and he wasn't rich. He wasn't much of a catch, in fact. And Germaine Greer uh, suggests that both families would probably have been against the marriage. And so to make it happen, the couple decided to have a baby, which meant they had to get married before the child was born to save it from being illegitimate. However, all of that is just a bit of a hypothesis, really. Very little is known about Shakespeare. Uh, we like to think we know a lot about him, but... We don't know so much. So what are the themes? Well, relationships is one of the major themes of the play, Much Ado About Nothing. And obviously there are different relationships that we see. Uh, the relationship explored between Beatrice and Benedict is a very modern one. And it doesn't really fit in with the Elizabethan ideal. They know each other warts and all, and their merry wall, as it is called, ensures they notice and talk to each other at every opportunity. But despite disguising it as a chance to be insulting about him, we notice in Act 1, Scene 1, that Beatrice is actually trying to get information about Benedict from the messenger. Has he returned safely? Was he brave? Who is his friend? Now, Claudio and Hero are the other relationship we can look at. And we know that Claudio had looked at Hero, as he explains, with a soldier's eye that liked but had a rougher task in hand than to drive liking to the name of love. So in other words, you know, he'd, he'd seen her, but his mind was on the war. But Beatrice says she had promised Benedict that she would eat all of his killing, which suggests they definitely knew each other before the soldiers went off for war. And the pre-existing relationship is confirmed later in the scene when Beatrice says, I know you of old, meaning she has experienced all his tricks before. In Act 2, we discover a bit more about their former relationship, but for now it's worth noticing how paranoid Benedict is about being cheated on. He calls Beatrice Lady Disdain, suggesting she's always putting him down, scorning him. And again in Act 2, we see more of the effect that her scornful attitude has on him. The real giveaway, of course, is Benedict's verdict that Beatrice is actually much more beautiful than Hero. He says to Claudio, there's her cousin, and she were not possessed with a fury, exceeds her as much in beauty as the first of May doth the last of December. So in other words, he admits she's beautiful, but very headstrong. Shakespeare loves to play with words and, and lots of double meanings in language throughout the play, throughout all of his work. For example, when Beatrice says, is it possible disdain should die when she hath such meat food to feed it? The word meat means suitable, M-E-E-T, but of course it's a pun on meat as well, linking with the idea of eating food. And the use of animal imagery in their sort of slang in match suggests that despite the fact that they're trying to be witty, their insults are very basic emotions, animalistic. Whereas on the other hand, we can contrast that basic animalistic imagery that they use with the imagery used by Claudio. For example, he calls Hero a jewel, claiming, in my eye, she's the sweetest lady that ever I looked on, and I looked upon her with a soldier's eye. 
So basically the, the suggestion here is that the imagery used about love is very different. And this is something we see in Romeo and Juliet as well. Shakespeare often uses this sort of unrealistic, um, sort of um, rich and, yeah, just outside of the normal life imagery to do with unrealistic ideas of love. You know, you can call her a jewel, but actually she's not. But we get the idea as well that there's this rather strange thing at the end where Claudio leaves the chatting up of Hero to Don Pedro. So it seems that he perhaps is more in love with the idea of being in love than with Hero. Shakespeare seems to suggest that Claudio is playing a role when Don Pedro says, Thou wilt be like a lover presently, and tire the Hero with a book of words. And that also suggests he's been twisting a fine story or manipulating the conversation to get Don Pedro to agree to broker the deal in his name. So there are two very contrasting relationships established in this opening scene. Both, arguably, by the end we know will be about love. One is very realistic and full of banter and argument, and the other is very surreal, ethereal and unrealistic. And the imagery from animalistic imagery to the unrealistic imagery of, of jewels and precious stones is used by Shakespeare to back up that although these are two relationships and one seems to be more positive than the other, actually it's not quite as simple as that. If you found this video useful, please give it a thumbs up and do pick up the revision guide through following the links in the description.